Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Shell Cathan was the very first person hired by Jeff Bezos to launch Amazon.com. A lot of people consider Shell to be a co-founder of Amazon in all but title because he, along with Paul Davis, was largely responsible for the entire technical architecture that Amazon launched with from the website to the back-end systems that made selling books on the internet possible. I was thrilled when Shell agreed to talk to me because he does not give a lot of interviews, and I knew that he could shed some light on the earliest Amazon details that absolutely no one else in the world could. Shell gives us the background on everything from the earliest commerce systems to the development of Amazon's famous review and recommendation systems. This is such a fascinating, detailed look at Amazon's earliest beginnings, and I think it reminds me of all the great details we got from the Mosaic and Netscape engineering teams when we spoke to them in the earliest interviews for this project. So, I know you're going to love episode 50, an interview with Amazon's employee number one, Shell Caffin. Shell Caffin, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. I'm glad to be here to talk to you. Um, so, from my research, not only um, are you a um, an alumni of UC Santa Cruz, but you're also a, a Santa Cruz native, is that right? Um, well, not exactly. I moved there to go to college in 1970, mm-hmm. and uh, up until the time I moved to Seattle to work on Amazon, I lived there most of the time, with the exception of a few years in first Palo Alto, where it's, which is closer to where I came from, and then my first computer industry job was in Los Angeles, so I was going for, for that for a uh, few years or so. And uh, your degree was in uh, mathematics? That is correct, just an undergraduate degree. So uh, let's start with um, with your career, uh, with the little, the, the sideline here of your time with the uh, Whole Earth Truck Store. Oh, okay. Well, um, I I grew up in uh, Menlo Park. That's where where we moved when I was about ten years old, and I, we stayed there till I was I moved off to college. And um, part of what was happening around there in the late '60s was uh, an organization called Portola Institute, which um, where um, through some high school friends of mine, I I got to know the people that ran that. And one of the projects out of Portola Institute was the Whole Earth Catalog. And um, actually, uh, um, the Portola Institute, we we used to spend some time in their offices because they let uh, let our little high school rock band practice there. Uh, And and the the Whole Earth uh, truck store was just across the alley from there. So you know, I got I got familiar with that, and also when I when I first saw the catalog, the first catalog, which came out in 1968, uh, it was really um, you know quite a quite a revelatory experience, and um, I, I got very interested in it, and and in a lot of the ideas that were being propounded in it, and the people that were making it, and I you know some some of my friends from uh, from school were working on typesetting for it. And so I, um, in the summer, um, between my senior year and when I went off to, uh, university, I, um, I worked there for a few months. I just walked in there one day and asked, uh, um, the guys who were running it, if, if it would be okay if I worked there and they said, sure. So I did. And I, so that was my first exposure to the mail order world, in particular mail order books. And I worked on Various, you know, rather mundane aspects of that business. Although it was, it was a pretty fun place to be at that time. Various, you know, people coming through all the time, and, and you know, uh, 
the, the uh, people that were running it were pretty interesting also. So, so you, uh, you were behind the register and things like that? I did that. I did some uh, subscription fulfillment. I did, uh, you know, some um, um, just packing, shipping and packing books. And um, I did some some bookkeeping and, you know, taking the taking the daily receipts off to the bank and that kind of nonsense. It's it's fascinating to me how many ways and in how many stories you know Stuart Brand and, and Whole Earth people uh, weave into into all these different stories that that we've been covering so far. Um, so moving on to to after college, um, moving into to the eighties and the nineties, you worked at several different uh, startups. Um, we don't have to go too far into them, but uh, one was Lucid, which was a an artificial intelligence software. Um, almost. It was a it was a Lisp Systems uh, company, uh, which um, in the mid '80s that was the era of the Symbolics Lisp machine and all mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people uh, were in love with for various reasons, and and uh, as the um, commodity workstation market started, you know, coming into into place, uh, um, there were a couple of Lisp systems that got built for that, and Lucid was one of them. And yeah, so I worked for them for about a little more than three years, from '85 to, and I guess '89 sometimes. And a, another one that caught my eye was uh, uh, Frox, I guess, um, which was some sort of um, home home multimedia theater type deal. Yeah, that was a, an attempt to make a um, home theater before the idea of home theater existed. So it was. Uh, you know, um, we were sort of grasping in the dark, and there wasn't really a market for it, and the company had trouble getting financed. Um, so that, again, was an interesting company. The guy that ran it was named Hartmut Esslinger, who was the founder of Frog Design, which is an industrial design company that's done a lot of work for right. Apple right. and other companies. Right, right. Um, and so then the, the job that you have in the early 90s uh, prior to... Uh, the story we're going to delve into uh, was that joint um, venture between IBM and Apple, right? Yeah, one of them. There was a couple at the time. It was mm-hmm. called Coletta Labs, and um, and it was a it was a basically building a platform for publishing multimedia content on that had a scripting language and a storage layer and that kind of thing. And I was working on some of the I was the storage layer was what I was working on for that. So going going down that list, and I I know we left some other companies out and things like that. But to be clear, uh, you hadn't been working on anything that was internet or especially obviously web related up until this point. Well, the web didn't really exist exactly, until right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I saw the first I saw Mosaic, which was the first uh, graphical web browser. One of the younger guys at Collida brought that in. He had, I guess uh, seen it. The earlier versions of it at uh, his um, school, and um, so that you know, when I saw that, it was a light bulb kind of went off. That you know, I had been using the internet for a long time, even before it was the internet, and um, uh, and uh, you know, it always struck me as one of those things where um, I, I I just thought it was amazingly cool, and I did I it, I didn't really understand why everybody else didn't also think it was amazingly cool. But when I when I saw the when I saw Mosaic for the first time, I, it made me realize that you know that of course the reason that most people had not uh, been using it is because it had all these very arcane interfaces that you know along the lines of you know text based Unix systems and things like that used to give people, and so it, it but it suddenly became pretty obvious that this. That this was going to be a game changer for um, people being interested in using the internet. So um, I I knew that that was going to it was going to be a big wave of some kind. I didn't I don't think I really knew how big it was going to be, but but I knew it was going to be a, something transformative. So I wanted to get in on it um, pretty soon. And I get the impression that around this time also your you're sort of uh, on the lookout for something new to do and a, a new wave to catch because you were kicking around startup ideas at this point? Um, well, I left Collida at a certain point when it sort of became clear to me that it was 
not too likely to succeed. Um, there were always a lot of, you know, kind of difference of opinion between Apple and IBM about what it should do. And it just was kind of a, it was a weird hybrid that wasn't really a, a, you know, either company and it wasn't really a startup either. So it was kind of, I, you know, it was interesting work for a while, but I, but I left there and I was definitely, um, after having left, I was starting to think about how I could get involved in the web, um, which was, you know, in its early stages, and and like everybody else, I, I was struggling for some idea of what kind of business would make sense to do with it. And I had a friend who was also, um, I, I, I'm trying to remember if he had left his previous job or not, but he and I, we both lived in Santa Cruz, and we had worked together a couple of times at Prox and at Xerox, um, and, and we were just kicking around ideas about things that might make sense to do. And um, that's when we started, uh, um, you know, realizing that we needed to have um, more of a business guy involved with us. And we started um, talking to people in our networks to, to see if we could find anybody that, to work with. Because, you know, we were basically primarily technical guys. And we kind of knew that we needed somebody to help define a business plan and raise money and, you know, manage marketing and all of that kind of thing what, for whatever it was we were going to do. So that was when we kind of started the process that ended up with us meeting Jeff. How, how, does the, how are the introductions with uh, Bezos made? Um, okay, well, my friend, um, his name is Herb Jelinek, and he lives still in Santa Cruz or south of there. And um, he had gone to grad school at Stanford, and one of his friends from there was one of the early programmers, maybe even the first one at D.E. Shaw, where Jeff worked. Right. So Herb talked to him, and he knew that Jeff was going to be leaving to do something, because Jeff had been analyzing business plans for D.E. Shaw, and one of the ones he had analyzed was, you know, being a bookseller. And um, so that guy put... Herb in touch with Jeff, and Jeff came out to visit us in Santa Cruz, and we went out for breakfast, and even ended up looking for uh, looking at different office um, space areas anyway around Santa Cruz, and thinking about locating there once he got interested in us. In us. But he did, you know, he he eventually made job offers to both of us, and then. Well, I can't remember the exact sequence, but he he also decided he didn't want to locate in California, um, so um, he had a couple of other uh, possibilities um, in mind. One of them one of them was going to be some unspecified place in Nevada, and the other one was going to be Seattle. And um, had it been Nevada, I think the odds of me having decided to make that move from Santa Cruz would have been a lot lower. Um, as it was, it was a pretty difficult decision for me. Took, uh, I, I, we, we were talking in the spring, and I didn't move up here until um, October of 94. We've been talking about how Miro lets you work closely with your team, but let me come at this from a slightly different angle. What about the client, the customer? What if you could involve all stakeholders in the design process in real time? You've been iterating on the product, you need feedback from the client, and Miro lets you do that easily. Building journey maps helps you turn a good product experience into a great one. On Miro's infinite canvas, you can lead discussions about user needs, brainstorm improvements, and improve the consistency of the experience. Conduct customer or user interviews and capture insights on sticky notes. Map the customer experience along touch points, tracking their needs, emotions, and more. Identify problems with your current product or service and then map out potential solutions. Imagine how much you could shorten the time to launch when your team and all stakeholders are aligned in real time throughout the whole process. Empower your entire team to take ideas from better to best with Miro. Sign up today at Miro.com slash podcast. And if you use that link, your first three Miro boards are free forever when you sign up. That's Miro, M-I-R-O dot com slash podcast. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you know how much time I spend doing the show, on my various businesses, on the fund each week? Do you ever wonder where I find time to spend time with my kids and my wife? Here's a better question. 
How much time do I set aside to spend on myself? When we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. That's where therapy has helped me for more than a decade now. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash techmeme today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash techmeme. So, so what was it then that made you decide to jump on board if it was a tough decision? Was it you like the idea of, of selling books specifically? You like the idea of doing the web? Or was, was it that Jeff seemed to be like a guy that, that could be successful doing something? Um, well, it's a combination of things. For one, one of the things that I'd been thinking about that I thought the web would be great for would be building um, a hypertext version of essentially books in print or a, a card catalog at your library, if any of the listeners are old enough to remember those. Um, um, and you know, just to make it easy, easier to kind of navigate the space of books, and and so I've been kind of noodling on that idea even before meeting Jeff, and and so one of the reasons I wanted to do the do Amazon was because that was going to be a you know a chance for me to do do that that I had already wanted to do. Plus, you know, it also connected with um, something from my past about selling books, mail order, I was, you know, uh, I've always been a book lover, and, and I really liked the idea, you know, it, it seemed kind of like a continuation of the, of the whole earth catalog idea of making tools essentially available to people wherever they might be, and, you know, just making, to put it in Stuart Brand's phrase, accelerating access, and um, so, uh, and then, yes, Jeff, you know, made a made a good impression on me, and, um, I, you know, I thought it was um, a good sign that to have somebody involved that already kind of understood how to operate in the financial world, and I thought that would probably make fundraising a lot easier, and I, it, he did seem like somebody, you know, he was a very young vice president at one of the most technically ad advanced hedge funds in New York um, that had already had quite a reputation, so I... You know, I thought, well, he probably has a certain gene for success in him. So, you know, it was all those reasons and probably others that I can't think of. I think I also was just ready to do something different because I, I really was kind of tired of just having jobs, even in, you know, ostensible start startups around the Valley. The kind of jobs that I could get were not really something that was exciting me much anymore, and I... I, I needed to have some kind of a change. So when you do finally, uh, after several months, make the move up to, to Seattle, it, you're, you're still the only hire at this point, right? It's just you, Jeff, and his wife, Mackenzie, at, and, and working out of their garage, right? Um, yeah, it was... Uh, um, yeah, at, at, that, at this point, they had just rented a, a house in Bellevue, and they were going to... The first office was in the g garage, which had already been converted, so it was really just a not particularly well-heated part of the house. And, um, you know, we didn't have anything... When, when I got there, it, it was basically just not even on a business plan on paper. It was a couple of spreadsheets and a verbal description of it. So... Um, you know, I, I kind of knew what I needed to do, so I just set about doing it and started um, buying some computers and uh, shopping for database software and setting up, uh, you know, a development environment and that kind of stuff. And how soon did uh, Paul Davis get recruited to come on board? Um, he got there about a month after I did. I started in late October of 94, and it was about a month. Were you involved at all in, in uh, recruiting him and hiring him? Um, I I didn't make the you know and a professor that Jeff knew I guess um, knew that he was on staff at UW and he made that he introduced Paul to us but 
and I certainly talked to him, and, you know, we seemed to be compatible, so I, I was involved in the decision, yeah. So before we, we delve into um, the systems that you set up, because that, I, that's what I want to do uh, somewhat of a deep dive on, um, still around this time, they're, they're kicking around various names, and the leading contender at the time was Kadabra, and apparently you were not a fan of Kadabra at all. Oh, well, um, I, I could have the sequence a little bit wrong here, but I recall being surprised after having moved up here that the name of it was going to be Kadabra. And I really had a sort of thinking feeling about the whole thing after that, and um, um, which I didn't really voice terribly much. But um, at a certain point, I guess it was um, the lawyer, the corporate lawyer that um, Jeff had hired or, you know, contracted with to work on the incorporation paperwork and stuff who... Um, either he or somebody he had talked to had heard it as cadaver on the phone, and that, I guess, was enough to convince Jeff that maybe it wasn't the greatest name ever. Um, but, and that, to me, that was also funny because uh, I had one of the, my previous, um, in my, one of my previous lives, I was part of a little consultancy that never quite got off the ground that was called the Symmetry Group, which mm-hmm. is sort of a pun on a mathematical concept, and um, people on the phone would hear that as the cemetery group. So I thought, oh my God, this is just falling. Hmm. Well, how did you how did you feel about the the ending up with the name Amazon? Um, I was okay with it. You know, I, I, I've been involved in enough naming processes over time uh, that um, you know it, it's very it's very hard to find good ones. It's, far, it's hard to find. It, it's almost impossible to find names that everyone agrees on. And, uh, you know, um, after a few things got kicked around that really weren't so great, um, um, one day I got there and Jeff um, had come up with Amazon.com as the name and and made it pretty clear that it wasn't up for discussion. And I was cool with it. I didn't love it, but I thought it was okay. So let's get into into what you're doing at this point. Um, you You didn't as far as I can tell, you didn't have any previous experience with web development generally, but then at this point, not a lot of people did, right? Yeah, and the people, most of the websites at that time were just static collections of pages. It was just HTML. So the whole uh, thing of, you know, backing up a website with an active program was, uh, there was very little experience doing that. There were some hooks in the early web servers. Um, that let you do let you run scripts, but um, doing anything that kept uh, kept track of the state of what the user was doing um, that was a little bit new. I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I would hesitate to claim that we were the first ones that did anything with that. But mm-hmm. we, you know, kind of had to roll our own uh, mechanisms for doing that. You were, so were, when, were there were, were there packages available from like the NCSA and stuff like, at that point? Um, they were the ones who produced, you know, both Mosaic and the, the uh, first uh, HTTP server that we were using. And so the development that you start with, it, it, you're mostly working in, in C and, and Perl, is that right? Um, mostly C, um, some Perl, um, so, just sort of to glue various things together, but mostly C. And what about the databases? Um, well, um, you know, we, neither Paul nor I were relational database um, experts, really. So um, we, um, I think I started shopping for databases before Paul even got there. And I, at, at that point in time, the two contenders were um, Oracle and Sybase. Um, Sybase didn't return my calls, so uh, I ended up with Oracle. And what is, what's the main focus that you're working on first? Is it creating the front end or getting the, the whole back end in term of, terms of the catalog and that sort of stuff set up before you start worrying about, like, you know, the, the user end of it? Well, um, as I um, sort of mentally divide things up, the catalog was actually part of the front end because it was part of the customer-facing mm-hmm. um, aspect of things. But I kind of 
the, Paul and I kind of divided up the work. Mostly, he took care of the back end, which was, you know, the warehouse functions, uh, receiving, um, storing, and shipping books. And I took care of um, the website and uh, the book catalog and pretty much all the, the directly customer-facing software. And so the catalog is built off of using like the, the books and print CD-ROMs and, and catalog stuff from, from Ingram and, and Baker and Taylor, right? Um, not books and print. Um, okay. But, um, we had the only things we really had were the inventory um, data from um, Baker and Taylor and Ingram. And um, Baker and Taylor's inventory um, database was, I'm pretty sure it was derived from the books and print data. Um, but, I, you know, we had to do, they both had some pretty rough um, stock information in their um, databases, which they would release at different intervals. And so I had to come up with some kind of process to rationalize not only the availability information, but also just the bibliographic information, which would be, um, you know, it was full of mistakes and, and had to be, we had to have some processes for reconciling that. I had read that um, a lot of the early work that you were doing was also maybe prioritizing email, which made sense to me because at this point, I don't think even, you know, things like AOL and CompuServe uh, had turned on the web yet. So uh, maybe you were expecting that most of the transactions would come over email. Is that right? Um, well, Jeff um, told us that he wanted to have both a web-based store and an email-based store. Um, Paul kind of did a few things to support the possibility of that, but um, having to prioritize and having my own opinions about things, I kind of ignored the whole email deal. And <laughs> we had, um, uh, you know, our hands full making the website work and just never got around to that. And I, I didn't think it was ever going to work anyway, so I, I, I just didn't want to work on it. So I didn't. So as you're designing the website, um, bandwidth has to be an issue as well, not not on your end as much as on the user's end, because, again, we're back in the day of 14.4 of modems and things like that. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, we um, one of the text-only browsers was one of my test cases to make sure things would work for people that were really on highly bandwidth-constrained uh, um, connections. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of it was still dial-up, yeah, at that point. So, yeah, we, you know, first off, we didn't have a lot of content that was going to soak up a lot of bandwidth, so that was okay. And, um, you know, even so, we tried to design things so that it would, um, you know, we get the most bang for the buck in terms of the number of, of um, the size of the pages that we asking people to download, because it was an issue then. It took a long time. Want a better way to simplify your business finances across expenses, vendor payments, and accounting? If so, Ramp could be a complete game changer for you. Ramp is the corporate card and expense management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your pocket. Ramp is easy to use. Get started, issue virtual and physical cards, and start making payments in less than 15 minutes. Whether you have five employees or 5,000, Ramp gives your finance teams unprecedented control and insight into company spend. With Ramp, you're able to issue cards to every employee with limits and restrictions and automate expense reporting. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time so you don't have to. You'll never have to chase down a receipt again, and your employees will no longer spend hours submitting expense reports. The time you'll save each month on employee expenses will allow you to close your books eight times faster. And Ramp saves you money. Businesses that use Ramp save on average 3.5% the first year. And now, get $250 when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash techmeme. Ramp.com slash techmeme. R-A-M-P dot com slash techmeme. This episode of the Tech Meme Ride Home is made possible in part by Mimecast. You're wondering if you need more email and collaboration security, or if you're good with what you've already got. After all, you've already got M365 protecting your workspace. That's good enough, right? What more could you need? Except... 
Except one of your employees just opened a phishing email, and M365 couldn't handle it alone. Now your company is ground to a screeching halt. Transformers stop transforming, circuits short-circuited, all because of an email. Next time, take five minutes to set up Mimecast, a security solution specifically designed for email and workplace collaboration. It detects suspicious emails and diversifies your security stack, so you're not just relying on one generalized solution. Mimecast is best-in-class protection against the most sophisticated attacks, from phishing and impersonation to BEC and zero-day threats. Email is the number one attack vector. But with Mimecast's best-in-class solutions, the most dangerous threats can be the least of your worries. Get another layer of protection for your inbox and keep your business from, you know, falling apart. For a free trial, go to Mimecast.com. That's Mimecast.com. And what about the because I haven't even asked now about the the actual commerce side of the equation. So how were you originally set up to take orders and to take money from customers? Um, well, um, people could enter their credit cards in our forms uh, on, on in the order process, or they could enter just the last five digits of their credit cards and then um, get us the full credit card number, which we could match elsewhere. Um, and some people would would even um, just email their full credit card number to us as if that was somehow more secure than um, entering it in a, uh, on a form on the web. Um, and some would call uh, our phone number and leave it to us that way. And so we had some customer service tools that would would uh, match up full credit card numbers to the last five digits and. Um, you know, insert them into the order order information in the database that way. And then, when it came time to to charge people's credit cards, the first our first system was a batch um, system that ran on a PC. We had to write write out a floppy disk and walk it across the room to it and do it that way. And it, it was quite a while actually before we had enough business to justify a full time connection to a, a credit card processor. Well. Yeah, were, were, were you also good. doing that to to keep the numbers secure? Because it, that would make sense if the computer's not connected, then it um, can't get well, stolen. We did take steps to keep credit card numbers secure, but those were that was a different set of steps. We we had a system that was that I had um, called Credit Card Motel because the credit cards could check in but not out. Um, that that um, that was connected via. Uh, a serial line to our servers that ran, um, it all ran a kind of a one-way protocol that would, where you couldn't actually retrieve the credit card number via that link, and which I guess that was Jeff's idea to do that, um, uh, but that's how we did it at first. I have no idea what, how it works now, but so we basically had a, a, a fairly isolated system that had that kind of sensitive information on it. And, and from that one had the tools that let us create the floppy disks at first and later ran the connection to a credit card processor. This is jumping ahead just a bit, but it, I was just thinking, if, if you have any memory of the, the beta test especially, but even the first year, how, how, what percentage of people did the call in and give you the last six numbers? But how, what percentage were reticent to, to do the credit cards on, on the web? Oh gosh, I, I can't give you statistics at this point. It, it, you know, I think at first it was a lot of people that would just give us, what, you know, what we called the tail of the credit card number on, online, and then they would call us later. But it seemed like that phase kind of – people got over that phase relatively soon. I mean, there were still people – I guess there probably still are people that don't want to give their credit cards online, but um, – and, you know, probably for some good reasons, but, um, you know. Um, I, I, I can't really give you dates or percentages, sorry. But it, Right, right. I, I just wondered if it was a majority early on, or, but mm -hmm. that makes sense that it would go down over time. Um, let's see. I, uh, one, a couple other detail questions. Um, so at this point, there aren't cookies and things like that. I mean, there probably are, but how, how are you... What are the systems that you're coming up with to track customers around the site and things like that? Um, well, cookies were there fairly early, but not everybody, you know, especially at the beginning, 
in the early adopter crowd, a lot of people had that turned off because they, they didn't like it. Um, so, um, and, and anyway, before cookies came into um, existence, um, there were some techniques um, that and that where you basically put a session ID or something like it into the URLs that you were sending out as part of the page. Just, you know, the page is dynamically created and the um, URLs that you put out on the page are also dynamically created. And as part of that, you can have some information that is just relevant to the one customer. And that is, in fact, you know, the way that, um, you, you know, even if you have multiple servers and so forth, since that information is coming in in the next request from that customer as part of the URL that they click on, um, that is enough to kind of create some continuity in the customer's experience. Link, link up their, what they're doing to whatever is in the server-side databases. So it was mostly just session IDs like that. Yeah, and Paul had brought the, the, the techniques for managing that from UW where he had learned them or um, had a part in thinking them up. I'm not even really sure. But, but that, that type of technique was, was somewhat known when we got started. So I kind of just, um, you know, adopted that and used basically just a, a key that was in the URLs that would connect um, um, requests from people's web browsers to whatever session information, shopping basket, all that kind of stuff existed on our servers. What about the, um, the, the shopping cart or shopping basket metaphor. Um, was that something that you guys had seen? Was that already kicking around other places before, or was that something that you... How did, how did you guys arrive on that metaphor? Um, well, I think it, it just seemed... I think it was just... I don't remember having seen it, but it was sort of like the only alternative unless you were asking people to buy things one at a time. You had to have a way of kind of identifying something, putting it somewhere, and then when you're ready to check out, check out with everything you want to buy at once, because you know, we all even from the beginning we had a shipping rate structure that kind of encouraged people to have multiple items in their orders. So, um, you know, it made sense. And and finally, um, the the reviews feature does that get um, implemented uh, even during the beta, or was that something that came later? It was pretty early on. Um, um, that arose from some discussions between myself and a friend of mine, um, Jed Harris, who I've done a lot of um, thinking with over the years. We've never worked at the same place, but we had a lot of ideas about crowdsourcing even pretty early on and, and had come up with the idea of just allowing customers to write reviews and it seemed okay with Jeff, so I, I just did it over a weekend one time and and seemed to be popular, so we kept it. And these were reviews that from day one um, any any customer or any person could contribute to, or was it originally designed for sort of like Amazon editorial? No, that, the customer reviews were designed for um, outside customers. Mm -hmm. uh, internal um, editorial stuff was all um, handled in different ways. So, but it's still for all of this getting getting it up and and doing the beta test. It's it's basically just you and Paul. Is that right? It is just me and Paul. Yeah. yeah. And and what was Paul like as a as a partner to work with on this stuff? Well, um, he's a delightful person. We're still friends. Um, he's um, a, a extremely fast programmer, um, and um, so he was very productive in the year. And I think it was he only stayed there for like a year and a quarter. Um, but he basically architected the whole back end, you know, all the warehouse stuff, and um, um, helped me with the database um, side of things. And and you know, we were both kind of uh, dipping into each other's code as necessary. You know, it was a pretty pretty uh, um, um, you know open ended collaboration, and we, we weren't. Either of us were too propri proprietary about the, uh, our code with respect to each other working on it. So we both worked on everything. I, I mostly worked on the front end stuff. He mostly worked on the back end stuff. And uh, um, and you know he did a lot in the time he was there. So how many months um, is the sort of 
public slash private beta that you guys run before you, you launch officially? I think it was two, three months, something like that. We, you know, we, I got there in October, late October of 94. The, the public opening was in July of 95. And I think it was maybe three months before that that we started letting friends and family poke at things. And it was pretty raw, but, uh, you know, they helped us find some silly bugs and, uh, uh, you know, iron out a few things. The uh, the internet's tell me that um, John John Wainwright placed the first order. Was he a friend of yours? Um, yeah, he was the um, senior um, architect at Kaleida Labs, and um, so he and some other um, uh, later people at Amazon all used to work with him and for him uh, back then. And uh, you know, he was in the beta, so yeah, uh, apparently he was the first person to actually pull the trigger and buy something. So once once the launch happens, I know that even early on, um, you know, you're not getting a ton of volume early on. But how stable and how successful do you think the the site was uh, around the launch period? Um, well, um, it, it it required you know a con- constant monitoring. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, it we didn't have too many outright outages, but we were still learning how to how to do this, and, and, you know, the scale kept multiplying. So, um, you know, at the, at the very beginning, we had um, our database and the web server all running on one machine, and one machine was a tiny little Sun workstation. So, um, you know, it, it didn't take long before we were sort of hitting the wall scaling-wise and, and trying, to come, trying to figure out ways of redoing things to be less monolithic and um, uh, um, be able to run partly on different machines and, and that sort of thing. You know, the, we, we got it, we went from nothing to a public opening in a pretty short amount of time. So, you know, in my earlier life, everything that we did up until then would have probably been scrapped and redone several times before it ever became a product. Um, but really, the very first thing that held together with, um, you know, paper clips and chewing gum was the shipping product. And so we had to not only keep adding things to it and cleaning it up and re-architecting and scaling and dividing it up to run on different machines, but we had to keep adding features. So, it, you know, we were kind of under the gun from the very beginning once we opened to the public. Well, actually, that, that makes me think, too, um, how much are you thinking of future scaling when you're working? I mean, I don't imagine that you guys, I, I, I'm sure you're hoping that you, there's a day coming where you'll have millions of customers, but are you thinking of that day when you're, when you're architecting this at the beginning? Well, I can only speak for myself on that one. I, I was not thinking in the millions of anything. Mm-hmm. So, so um, I was mainly concentrating on just making something work reliably and, I hadn't really had a lot, uh, a huge amount of operations experience previously. I, I did um, operate a bulletin board for a while, but that was you know, pretty small scale. Um, so um, but most of the problems having to do with that level of success were all things that I had to learn on the fly. So with the uh, initial launch, the, the the actual process is is fairly simple. A a, a customer searches for a book. Um, y- your system tells them if it's available, and if it's available, your system orders it and delivers it to you guys, and then you guys, literally you guys, <laughs> turn around and ship that to the customer, right? Um. Yeah, and you know sometimes there were some more manual steps involved, like for example. Anything that was available through a distributor, um, that path was reasonably well automated from the beginning. But anything that had to be directly ordered from a publisher, that was people doing that. So, you know, publishers, especially in those days, were, you know, a little behind the curve technologically speaking, and so you'd you'd typically have to order things from them over the phone and. And, you know, it might be weeks before they get it to you. 
So uh, in, in the first weeks and months, you're talking about getting on the phone and, and placing 10 or 20, 30 orders at a time and, and then having them shipped in. Um, yeah, um, and, you know, I personally wasn't doing that side of things, but, yeah, so we had some of the early hires were, you know, um, they needed to work with publishers to, to get all that get all that inventory in. And, yeah, the, the, in the beginning of the warehouse, you know, um, we would we didn't stock anything in inventory. We would just order things as customers ordered from us. And um, even even the way the the first warehouse was organized, you know, things would go into stacks on the shelves according to what customer had ordered them. So, you know, we'd wait until all those components of the customer's order got uh, arrived there, and then it was ready to be packed and shipped. And th this is a far cry from from two-day delivery, right? Uh, like, the average order might take a week, two weeks to, to get to the customer. Yeah, it would depend if on, uh, uh, you know, it was um, all available from distributors. I mean, we could get things from distributors overnight. Um, they, um, one of the reasons for locating in Seattle was that it was within a, a day's drive from the West Coast book distributors. And... Uh, you know, um, if, if there, on the other hand, if there were um, books from publishers, it, you know, it, we could split the order into multiple shipments, but, you know, all the pieces of it weren't going to get there until we got it, which might be, you know, three, four, or five weeks later. So how much is the front page article in, in the Wall Street Journal sort of the, the big bang for you guys, the thing that all of a sudden... Uh, really moves the needle and 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 volume takes off. Well, that was a, that was a big challenge. I mean, um, that you know our, the the traffic to the website and the number of orders definitely shot up starting then, and it was you know hang on by your fingernails time. Even more, we already were sort of were in that mode, but it, it definitely was shifting into a higher gear when that happened. Oregon State University is proud to be a sponsor of the Tech Meme Ride Home. Did you know Oregon State is ranked as the number three best university in the country for solving climate change? More than 70 faculty across the university teach or conduct research in this field, from the science behind climate change to mitigation and adaptation solutions. The Climate Science Program is built on a strong foundation of physical climate system science and mathematics. You can learn alongside your classmates through field courses and project-focused classes on climate data modeling and analysis. Oregon State makes seeking solutions a priority, going the farthest lengths to help the Earth and all living things thrive. Their creative minds, research knowledge, and drive inspire them to generate ideas no one else has. Oregon State will never stop doing the hard work. They will continue exploring, creating, and taking action on the issues that matter most to their students and their community and build a better world for future generations. Discover more at OregonState.edu. That's OregonState.edu. Men think losing their hair is inevitable, but not so. Take control of your hair's future with Nutrafol's science-backed hair growth supplement for men. Nutrafol provides a whole-body health approach for men that promotes healthier hair. No drugs, no compromises, just better hair. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist-recommended hair growth supplement, clinically shown to improve your hair growth, visible thickness, and visible scalp coverage. Nutrafol's hair growth supplements use physician-formulated natural science-backed ingredients, Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within by targeting root causes of thinning, such as stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, lifestyle, and metabolism, through whole body health. I use Nutrafol. Heck, my wife uses it too. She's a big fan. She complained of thinning hair after giving birth to our kids. Nutrafol is the solution she settled on. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month's subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com slash men and enter the promo code RIDE. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men, and enter promo code RIDE. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code RIDE. And the first year or so, the first two years, as as they're um, as you guys are starting to bring on new hires and and you're starting to grow this into an operation that can scale with this with this uh, 
you know, new volume of customers. Um, what's, what's the, what's the type of people like that they're bringing in? Because I, I spoke with Jane Slade and she has that famous, um, send us your freaks quote, but I, I also get the impression that these were really smart, hardworking people that ended up, uh, being successful at Amazon. Um, yeah, you know, at, at the beginning, it was um, nobody really knew us from Adam, so so we didn't really exactly have, you know, um, the first pick of, of um, people to hire. So, you know, we, we I, I think it was people that were, you know, we weren't going to hire anybody that wasn't pretty smart, but but also people that were attracted to, you know, kind of what was at that point a, a, a pretty funky. Um, an offbeat little startup that nobody was sure if it was going to succeed or not. You know, that, that's a, that kind of is a self-selecting kind of a thing. So um, we ended up with, you know, I, I would say at that point in time it was a, a bit on the bohemian side. You know, there, there were a lot of um, just kind of um, pretty intellectual, pretty um, quirky, interesting people that worked there, and that made it a lot of fun in those days. You'd already said that, um, at least initially, you weren't thinking in terms of millions of customers and things like that, but do you remember, was there a particular moment when you thought to yourself, oh my, this is, this is going to be something really bigger than I had anticipated? Um, well, there was, um, I doubt if I'll be able to remember all of such moments. There were lots of them, but probably, you already mentioned one of the main ones, which was the, the Wall Street Journal front page article, and then you know, the IPO was another time that was, um, you know, in the spring of 97, not that much later. Um, when we got um, sometime between those two events, when we the, the got venture capital financing and, um, you, know, you know, it was um, pretty much our, our pick of who we wanted to work with at that point. Um, you know, all of these things, uh, you know, tended to make it clear that it was going to be something bigger than just a startup that, you know, sort of succeeded and, and provided a sustenance for a few people, which was really all um, all that I had in mind at the beginning. You know, I, I, I didn't have a lot of uh, very uh, grand ideas of, of um, how big of a business it might end up being. I was just sort of, I was just really interested in having something to do with creating a business that was successful on any terms, and so many of the companies and startups I'd worked with were not. I was kind of thirsting for something that was going to exhibit basic signs of success. So um, all of the, you know, um, very rapid scaling and everything, it, in a lot of ways it caught me by surprise, but it was all, and it was extremely stressful, but it was also a really interesting challenge from an engineering perspective the kind of work that I had to do, so I, I was enjoying it. Well, I, there might there might be there might be several moments of this, but I was just going to say, can you think of several moments when you thought, "Oh boy, the the, the site's going to crash. We're we're hanging on by the skin of our teeth here." Um, well, there was a, a number of times when it actually did crash, and we were hanging on by the skin of our teeth. Um, there was one time early on when we, you know, before we had any bona fide. Um, Oracle experts on board we, that we had a database crash and um, a couple of us that really um, barely knew how to work the thing had to figure out how to put it all back together and uh, um, we, we managed to and there were other times when we had hardware failures and had to involve people. This was after we had a little bit bigger and a more important customer of Oracle but we had had to involve them in in helping put our database together after a da after a hardware crash that corrupted it, and uh, during which time we found out that our backups hadn't been working properly. And, um, so there was a lot, a number of scary, uh, you know, uh, kind of the kind of the um, deep, uh, moments there. Um, the the recommendation engine uh, recommendation system. When did that come in to play? Hmm. Well, hmm. okay. The the first thing that happened there, as I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to give you calendar date for right, it. Right, right. The first thing that happened was um, 
Jeff had become enamored of this collaborative filtering outfit and has licensed their software. And that um, we, we installed that, and it did not produce very good results. So um, some uh, programmers that were there at the time, um, probably this would be sometime late 96, early 97, I'm guessing. I'm not really sure. Um, they they started working on what was called similarities, where it would, where you know they, they would analyze the, the, the statistics of who had bought what books and what other books, and would distill that down into you know some useful um, links. It, it wasn't personalized, but it it did kind of show you know people that were interested in X were also interested in Y, and that was a good guide for people. To the to the best of your knowledge, um, was the idea uh, with Jeff always to move beyond books? Like books was just sort of a, 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 a an initial test case. Um, well, um, to the best of to the best of my knowledge at the time, um, that was not the case. Uh, but I think that was just because he wasn't he was being more closed mouth about it than I than I thought, and he did always have the sort of odd turn of phrase that books were the first best product to sell on the internet. And um, so I guess that sort of implied that he was already thinking about other uh, products than that could follow. But it wasn't too long before we started diversifying into um, music and um, videos anyway. A, a while after that until we got into other types of products. Mm -hmm. Um, was there any sense at some point that this this fun uh, selling books on the internet project that you had signed on for maybe a little hesitantly had suddenly gotten to become some some monster that that maybe uh, wasn't what you signed up for? Um, well, that's a little bit of a frog in slowly boiling water story. Um, um, you know, it, it definitely happened, but it, I would be hard pressed to name a specific date when that happened. I think probably around the IPO is when things kind of, as happens in a lot of companies that go public, um, things um, you know, kind of take a turn for the more serious and you start hiring boatloads of MBAs and uh, all the, the quirky bohemian people kind of are start to get marginalized a little bit. And, um, you know, so it, it happened that exactly exactly when, it, was, there, was there one moment when I, I, I suddenly realized it was happening? Not really. So when you eventually uh, do leave the company in, in 99, you're, you're sort of ready to go at that point? Well, I had been ready to go for a couple of years by that point. Um, my, in 97... Um, my original role was um, divided up between a couple of new hires, and I was um, uh, made CTO, um, but um, I didn't have access to any resources um, after that to do any new projects. So uh, ostensibly, I was still in charge of architecture, but the demands on the development groups were such that that was kind of an afterthought for everybody. So um, it was... Um, it just became too frustrating, and I, I, I knew um, pretty early on after that those changes happened that um, uh, I wasn't going to stay forever. When when you do leave, is there uh, a, an initial sense of exhaustion? Like this is a wild ride that I've, I've just gotten off, and thank God um, I've survived. Um, yeah, it was sort of a years long process of unwinding after that. Because, you know, that was, Amazon was not my first or only startup. It probably wasn't even, even though it was kind of a relentless march, the, the, the work itself was was actually not as hard as work that I'd done in many other places, not as technical or, in, you know, kind of deeply complicated. Um, so um, I, I, was, I was ready for a, a nice long break after that. 
Is there anything that you can point to? As you said, you, you were the veteran when you joined uh, Amazon of, of several different startups, but um, not a lot that, that, you know, were probably none that were nearly as successful as Amazon. Can you think of like one or two things that um, in retrospect made Amazon succeed where other, other teams you were on didn't? Well, the first, the first and main thing was that it had a clearly defined product and, and um, a, a clear community of potential customers. Um, many of the things that I'd worked on, you, you mentioned the Frox product that I worked on. Well, that thing was, you know, a really interesting technical problem. And there's some really smart people worked on it. And, but it was not really in tune or in time with the market that existed at that time. So, um, it, you know, it just never went anywhere. Um, whereas with Amazon, it was, you know, a pretty pedestrian product. I mean, you know, selling people books. Okay, that's not that exotic. Um, you know, the way we were doing it was something a little bit different, but it was, you know, I think the thing that, at least, in, you know, compared to my, my personal history, it was mainly that. It's just that there was, like, an obvious product and obvious people to sell it to. Um, I know that, that you, you left the company in 99, so I don't know, you know, what sort of um, access you would have, but... I want to ask a lot of Amazon people that I'll be talking to, how much of a fear was there after the dot-com bust? How much did you feel maybe even personally that maybe Amazon might not make it? Well, all that happened shortly after I left. Um, So I don't think it was because I left. um, Right. um, um, I did, you know... um, I did wonder what was going to happen with it. I thought, you know, I mean, every, you know, all all these companies were going out of business and it it wasn't, you know, I mean, I, I had a certain amount of faith um, that they, you know, were, were smart people that were serious about staying in business and, and succeeding, but I didn't know for a fact that they were going to be able to. Um. What do you think of what do you think of Amazon um, when you think of the company today in, in terms of what it's doing and where it's at? Um, oh boy, um, that could go on a, a number of different directions. But you know, it, I mean, obviously, it's a very diverse, very dominant, extremely competitive, ruthless, huge company now. It, it's hard for me to even sometimes I even just find it difficult to imagine that I actually had something to do with getting that thing started so different from anything that I ever had in mind when we started the thing are you uh are you an Amazon customer yourself um yeah sometimes I you know Sometimes I'm in a bad mood about them, so I don't buy things for a while, and sometimes I'm not, so I do. I told you before, I got lucky. I stumbled into a career that I love, I wanted to be a film director, and instead I ended up being a startup founder. If you're a software engineer looking to make an impact, maybe you should do what I did and consider looking beyond the obvious path. Bloomberg is building the world's most trusted information network for financial professionals, and they're looking for engineers to join them. I've never worked at Bloomberg, but there's no business or financial news source that I trust more, especially for this show. Also, think about it. At its core, Bloomberg is one of the world's preeminent data and technology companies. At Bloomberg, you'll devise solutions and systems that solve complex real-world problems for customers across the global capital markets. You'll be part of a team that builds and delivers tools to help the world's leading businesses and finance decision makers surface relevant information in an ever-expanding ocean of data and quickly act on it. The majority of Bloomberg software is built in C++, JavaScript, TypeScript, and Python, and Bloomberg engineers are active members of the open source community, both contributing to and leveraging open source software in their products. Working at Bloomberg means operating at insane scale. The company's real-time market data feeds ingest and process more than 300 billion, yes with a B, market data messages daily. 
Learn more about the opportunities that await you by visiting Bloomberg.com slash careers. That's Bloomberg.com slash careers. Today, I want to talk to you about how Miro works where you work. Miro connects with over 100 apps to align your teams and make your work more efficient, all in one scalable and secure space. I'm talking Atlassian, Google Workspace, Microsoft 365, Jira, Asana, Azure. All these plug into Miro. No matter where you work, Miro is there with less tabs, steps, and context switching and more visibility, speed, and access. With Miro as your team's main hub, you can bring in multiple sources to create a cohesive story, helping your team track updates, execute faster, and make smarter decisions. Transform uninspired meetings into engaging, purposeful, and fun experiences. Every meeting can end with an artifact, a Miro board that captures the conversation. Miro is also ISO 27001 enterprise grade security compliant. That's why 99% of the Fortune 100 are Miro customers, and there are more than 50 million Miro users around the world. Empower your entire team to take ideas from better to best with Miro. Sign up today at Miro.com slash podcast. And if you use that link, your first three Miro boards are free forever when you sign up. That's Miro, M-I-R-O dot com slash podcast. So let's let's end sort of with, um, you know, now looking back, it, it's almost exactly 20 years um, that that whole ride got started for you and, and for everybody with Amazon. Um Looking back, what what what's your favorite memory from, or the thing that you're most proud about uh, about uh, the the Amazon project that you worked on? Um, well, for me, I think it's still just um, making you know a much wider variety of books available to people in much more um, remote and um, locations um, than they ever could. Uh, could do before. Um, um, that was kind of what I wanted to do, at least the first step of what I wanted to do there, and I think we did did that pretty successfully. So uh, that's you know, and and personally, I'm 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 proud of the, um, the what I what I mentioned earlier on that sort of building a hypertext um, web version of the card catalog and books in print. Um, I think that was um, um, at, at a time when we had almost no content. That gave some people something to play around with, and you know, find books that were related to other books. And it was, you know, it was it was very sketchy, but it was um, it was something to do that made it fun to use our site. And I'm I'm also proud of of the fact that we were, you know, essentially on a very low budget and very small staff, we were able to build something that um, was pretty reliable and scaled up. You know, maybe it was messy sometimes, but we managed to keep things running and didn't have any, you know, fatal outages and um, kind of supported the business as it needed to grow. Well, you know, also, I mean, everyone tends to give a lot of credit to, to Google for this world that we live in where you know, information is always available at your fingertips and things like that. But, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember a day when there were certain books that you couldn't get, certain CDs that you couldn't get, you, you, there, an obscure band that you'd always wanted to hear, but you would never be able to find. Like, I think Amazon deserves a lot more credit for for bringing this information to everyone's, making it accessible to everybody. Um, yeah, I think that that is true. Um, you know, although... Technically speaking, you know, we weren't able to do anything any more than um, a bookstore or a music store could in terms of special ordering from publishers. But, you know, we did it in kind of on a day-to-day basis, and it was sort of central to our model as opposed to something that just happened, you know, if, if you could get some time from the clerk at the store to help you out. Right, but as a as a as a sixteen year old who I checked it out, my first Amazon order was a Humphrey Bogart biography that I couldn't find even at Barnes and Noble. Just to be able to do that myself, as opposed to having to go to the clerk, I mean that was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I I, I agree that, that I, you know I think that that was a qualitative change, and and I, I am proud of having had some part in making that happen. Well, uh, Shell Kaffin, uh, thanks so much for um, taking the time to remember all that for us. Uh, you're welcome. Congratulations on uh, uh, 20 years this year. Oh, thank you. 
If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.